Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for the 2020 Graduate College Distinguished Lecture, Civic Learning for a Diverse Democracy, Centering the Graduate Student Role, featuring Dr. Sylvia Hurtado from UCLA. Uh, my name is Keith Chandler, and I am the event coordinator with the Graduate College. Uh, before we begin um, the formal program, I would like to mention just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first, Yesterday afternoon, we sent out a little pre-event poll asking uh, our registrants today, when was the last time you took a course dedicated to the study of civics? Um, and I wanted to share those results with you. Um, we sent this question to 538 individuals that registered for today's event, including students, faculty, staff, members of the general community. Um, and this is what we received. Um, 138 responses, and as you can see, 1% of respondents indicated that the last time they uh, had a civics course was elementary school, 9% in middle school, 36% high school, 23% undergraduate education, 10% uh, graduate education, and 21% have never had a course dedicated to civics, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean that civic learning was or was not included in their education, uh, just that those individuals uh, didn't have a course dedicated specifically to the study of civics. Um, secondly, today, uh, we will be accepting your questions using the Q&A function here in the Zoom webinar. Uh, please feel free to submit your questions as they arise throughout the lecture. Um, and our speaker will use the latter half of our time today to address your questions, um, as many of them as possible. This year's lecture format is going to be conducted interview style, uh, facilitated by the Graduate College Associate Dean Tamara Underreiner. And now to make introductory remarks, I would like to welcome Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate College, Elizabeth Wentz. Dean Wentz, the floor is yours. Um, thanks, Keith, for getting this started. Um, and uh, Dr. Hurtado, thank you so much for, um, for being here with us today. I, I'm really excited about your comments. And of course, we wish you were here in person. Um, we have lovely sunshine outside, beautiful weather, and it would be wonderful to just walk you around campus and take you to one of our, our, our many nice restaurants. And hopefully you'll have the chance to, to come here in person to see what we have um, to offer at, at some point in time. Um, I'm going to just say a few things, but before I, um, before I get too off track, I want to um, acknowledge the Graduate College staff for their efforts in putting this event together. Um, you know, they did a lot of coordination and have really made the, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to an event that's going to be really smooth. So thank you so much to, to, um, to Keith, to Tracy, to Tamara and the others who have just done a, a really terrific job in advertising this and making this, this event possible. Um, so, Sylvia, I just kind of want to talk to you a little bit and just tell you a little bit about myself and about ASU and, and the Graduate College. Um, myself, I've been uh, on the faculty at ASU since 1997. I came here, actually, I was ABD um, and started a tenure track position here um, many, many years ago. And I've been here um, since then, went through the ranks, uh, full professor, and then I've been in several leadership positions. Um, I've only been the Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate College since this summer, um, so I've been transitioning into a new role um, because our former Dean um, left for a different position outside of ASU. So it's been just a really great opportunity for me to um, step in and learn about what has been going on in the Grad College and really aim to make a difference. It's been challenging in this new um, in, in, the, in the time of, of COVID and a lot of social unrest, but it's been really great to sort of take, um, take the leadership role. Um, one of the characteristics of ASU is that we're incredibly part of our, proud of our charter um, here at ASU. And the charter is really about um, inclusion and success. Um, it was kind of formed around students and student success. You know, a lot of universities pride themselves on whom they exclude by saying, you know, we had, you know, X number of people, you know, apply to our institution and we only accepted 3% of it. And they consider this a badge of honor because they think of it as being, you know, you know, these are, we, we have the best students that, that are out there. Um, we have actually a strong sense of responsibility for, um, for the communities that we serve by saying that higher education, high quality higher education needs to be something that's accessible 
um, to, to everyone. And so we build our charter around inclusion on advancing um, research and discovery of public value. And we assume the fundamental responsibility of the economic, social, cultural, and overall health of the communities that we serve. One of the things that's been great to follow is that the, there's been a transformation of this charter to not just be about um, student success, student inclusion, which generally focuses on undergraduate students, um, but broader inclusion. So graduate students, the staff here on campus and faculty, and really recognizing that we want to um, be inclusive and recognize for the success of of everyone who is part of the ASU community and beyond. Um, so now because of this presentation today, we consider you part of the ASU community um, as well. Um, another fundamental characteristic is our um, design principles. Our design principles are really about catalyzing social change, being connected to social needs, um, connecting communities through um, partnerships, um, and work with people on local, national, and international issues of, of importance. And of course we see the graduate students and then we also have um, postdoctoral scholars that we support by creating a community for postdocs as well. But we see the graduate students and postdocs really making the institution work. Um, they are working with faculty and are engines of innovation. Of course they provide instructional support um, and they not just come here to learn. We don't see students who just come here to say, I want to absorb knowledge. Um, but they are creating new knowledge and they bring their own worlds of experience um, to what they do. Um, I wanna speak a little bit to civic learning because of course that's an important um, piece of this uh, conversation today, but civic learning is now part of ASU's DNA. One of the things that we recently launched um, is a partnership with the Truman Foundation. Um, we are committing to supporting um, helping to support the, the Truman Scholars that come. I don't know if you know, if people here know about the Truman Foundation, but it's really based in uh, civic learning and public, uh, public service. Um, we're really happy about this particular lecture series. We wanna have a distinguished lecture each year. And I think that it's fantastic, um, Dr. Hurtado, that you're here today. Um, we make a commitment every year to bring a leading scholar to engage um, our ASU community in a discussion um, around the advancement of graduate education as public good. Um, and we look to how to attract and inspire future generations of learners and really thinking about us as being lifelong learners who will foster this opportunity in their communities. And so um, speaking to the broader audience, we've um, invited Dr. Sylvia Hurtado to speak today because of her ongoing research dedicated to creating environment of civic engagement in higher education. I wanna thank Sylvia for being here. I wanna thank all of, a, all of the people who are attending here for coming and joining in this um, important discussion. Um, so now I wanna pass this to um, our facilitator who's um, an important part of the Graduate College, the Associate Dean of the Graduate College, Dr. Tamara Underiner. So I'm gonna pass it to her. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Dean Wentz. You know, when we first began planning for this distinguished lecture about this time last year, we couldn't have imagined how exponentially more relevant, timely and urgent the topic would become. So it is indeed with great pleasure that I introduce this year's featured speaker for the Graduate College Distinguished Lecture, Dr. Silvia Hurtado. Dr. Tado is a professor at the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA in the Division of Higher Education and Organizational Change. Her numerous publications focus on undergraduate education, student development in college, and diversity in higher education. She's past president of the Association for the Study of Higher Education and served on the boards of the Higher Learning Commission and initiatives of the Association of, Higher, of American Colleges and Universities. Recent national projects include research on how colleges are preparing students to participate in a diverse democracy with the U.S. Department of Ed, the pathways of underrepresented underrepresented students in scientific research and professional careers with the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, and student and institutional outcomes of diverse and broad access colleges and universities with the Ford Foundation. She obtained her PhD from UCLA, a master's of education from Harvard, 
and her Bachelor of Arts from Princeton University. Dr. Hurtado, thank you so much for joining us today. We'd like to begin today's discussion by hearing a little bit more about your background and the path that led you to the research that you're doing today. And we'd be especially be interested in hearing about any experiences you had as a graduate student that formed your research agenda. So please welcome Dr. Silvia Hurtado. Thank you. So the next slide. So I want to start with, uh, well, first, let me say, Dean Wentz, this is wonderful to hear about the DNA of Arizona State um, and also its charter and principles because that's exactly linked with civic learning. And I want to talk a little bit more about broadening the notion of civic learning um, and, and just offer a few points. I want to start with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's um, statement in the 1960s he said now is a time to make real the promises of a democracy and i feel that this is so relevant today it could have set, been said yesterday or in this morning's news so i want to just sort of start with that as sort of thinking about what do we do to recenter civic learning and how do we incorporate graduate students in that in that process so i'll start with my story so the next slide I just have just a few key points about myself. I, I am a first generation uh, student to college. Um, I, I attended a predominantly Mexican American high school and neighborhood. Um, and so um, it was in the 1970s. So uh, things were a little bit different maybe then, but, uh, but now I think there are many, many first generation students uh, coming in terms of Latinos coming to our institutions, a high proportion, for example, at UCLA, about 70% of our Hispanic students are first generation, which is amazing. And then when we think at the graduate level, we're seeing very high proportions of first generation students now approach graduate education, which is, which is wonderful. I want to say something about my own experience, though. I didn't realize that, um, well, I know we didn't have any money, but I never thought I was poor or disadvantaged. Uh, and until I got to college <laughs> and income and racial inequalities really became very evident in college. As you start to compare yourselves with peers who are attending the best schools in the country and, uh, and have had many more opportunities than I had I realized that the world wasn't created the same. So college is a really important time for students to develop their identity, who they are. But I was very proud of my Mexican heritage. I still am today. Um, but I didn't realize there were these status differences until I got to college. And that hit me uh, immediately uh, in terms of anything from social to academic issues. And so I think that informed to a large extent the kind of research I do today. And I wanted to say there was something about the climate of the institutions that I wanted to tell the rest of the world about. So I began with um, doing some research in that area. So I have to say the college experiences inspired me to ask questions like, why is the world structured like this? Um, and I started to learn more from both my peers and also from uh, a variety of uh, instructors that I had, including graduate students as an undergraduate. And I think by the time I got to graduate school and I realized that the most empowering thing about graduate school is that I could ask any question and have the tools to answer it. To me, that was so empowering that I fell in love with research. I wanted to just keep asking questions. I didn't know that there was any job associated with that, but I just wanted to keep asking questions and finding answers. So I was in a postdoc and my mentor, who was Walter, Walter Allen, who was in sociology, African-American scholar, he said, you know, there's this job at the University of Michigan. I just said, oh, no, no, I, I'm in a postdoc. I've got two years. I, I don't need to think about the academic labor market. And in fact, I don't even know uh, I said, I just wanted to keep doing my research. And he said, Sylvia, uh, you can do research as a faculty member. And I said, yeah, but they make you do other things too. <laughs> so I'm not sure what they are, but 
In other words, I had no aspirations to enter as a faculty career, but I knew even from undergraduate experience and doing, uh, you know, some original research or them encouraging us to do it. And then in graduate school, I realized that I wanted to answer questions for the rest of my life. I wanted to ask the questions I wanted to ask with that freedom and then also to use the tools that I had obtained to answer it. So, so that's, that's my background. So I think graduate school was a very transformational time because I thought I would go back to just uh, running programs for students in higher education. I didn't think about, I knew research was important and literature was important, but until I was actually empowered to actually create knowledge myself, I didn't realize, uh, Anyway, so that's my background. So the next slide, I'm going to start talking a little bit about um, what is civic learning. And I want to start with, I'm glad you did this survey of civic courses, because typically, yes, um, in uh, K through 12, particularly uh, in high school, we have even civics uh, tests, right, at the state level. Uh, to understand that we know the principles uh, that are basic to our democracy and courses, but really civic learning at the college level and beyond takes on a broader connotation in a lot of the ways that Dean Wentz described in terms of what the, the key values and mission uh, and activities are of Arizona State. And so for civic learning, there's a, there's a number of areas that we say there's development. So instead of thinking about just of courses, think about or the what that is the the uh, the information of you know you know how bill gets passed, uh, you know what what are the constraints around voting? All of those things are taught uh, presumably in high school and uh, and middle school. So that's not unusual with the way uh, people responded. So the first area is really thinking about when you think about self of uh, civic learning is to think about the development of the self, that students are still discovering their identity. Um, in civic learning, they should think about how to use their voice, and also they continue to develop their sense of purpose. So by the way, I have master students that are still developing their sense of purpose as they're thinking about what they want to do with what they are learning and, and their world. So this is still very much applicable to graduate students. The other is thinking about diverse communities and cultures, how we develop empathy, appreciation for diverse uh, people from diverse backgrounds, recognition that there are inequalities, uh, racial, religious, economic, gender, all those are in existence in our society. So we understand more about communities and cultures. Uh, the other is thinking about knowledge, the creation of knowledge, how knowledge is constructed, um, and also being able to evaluate, uh, for example, uh, information literacy, understanding more about what the different forms of knowledge are, what the authorities are, that's very important at the graduate level. So that we're creating disciplined thinkers, not disciples. That is, we want individuals to be critical, and certainly that's a very key point of graduate education, is really thinking about how do we become critical thinkers about existing knowledge and about thinking about the kinds of knowledge we want to produce. The other component of civic learning are skills development. Uh, they're technical school skills that are very important, but also social skills um, that are going to be necessary for jobs of the future. Um, there are uh, economics uh, faculty like at Harvard have really studied job trends and have, un have realize that not only are their jobs going to require at least a BA for many of the uh, types of jobs, they're going to require technical and social skills. So those are really important to think. We are trying to convey that to our undergraduates, but it's certainly very important for graduate students as well. The other component of civic learning is thinking about values, ethical and moral reasoning, and democratic aspirations that we have for society. So that's another component. So I think when we think about civics in high school and middle school, we're so focused on the facts, we don't think about, and we have to begin to think about at this level uh, about values. And the final is really public action. Uh, what are the multiple forms of participation? What does that look like? 
Um, what are ally behaviors uh, that we can employ to work with others, to work with communities that are not like ourselves, that are different in background? Um, and so those are the key components, I think, of civic learning. This really, if it sounds like general education, it is. It's a component. The American Association of College Universities have talked about these civic learning areas and outcomes that are related to that. So just wanted to broaden the conception of what you think of civic learning is because it fits many of the kinds of activities that uh, Dean Wentz described for the, the whole institution. So next slide. So I'm going to sort of end on this point and then I want to turn to questions, but I want to say that now is the time to think about recentering civic learning. That is thinking about it, not just increasing graduation rates um, or, uh, or thinking about vocational aspirations, but really merging diversity and civic engagement activity on, on campuses. And I say this because very often some of our centers of civic engagement are units of, uh, upon itself, and then we have some diversity uh, units, what I would call diversity units that, that address diversity or different um, different communities, etc. But really thinking about how they come together, and there are some institutions that have already merged those too. Um, the other component is now is the time to focus on student learning, not just what students learn, but how they learn in classrooms and communities. And I think that's really important now that we're certainly online to really think about. Um, we're really rethinking a lot of the things that we do as a result of uh, we're. I was going to say this was imposed on us, though I know Arizona State has done a lot more online than we have done, for example, in the University of California system. But this was like, okay, we're in a new era. We have to rethink how learning occurs and what we do, because the what I think we've mastered pretty well. We can deliver that. There are many ways for us to deliver that. But the how we learn together, I think, is really key. So I want to think is now is the time to use pedagogy to think about ways to work through conflict and controversies. So that I'll talk a little bit about some of the dynamics that we use in intergroup dialogue and then connect the notion of self empowerment with the empowerment of local communities and not only local communities, but across the globe. And so there are a lot of campuses that are actually doing this. They have ways of working through um, uh, community problems or global problems in various communities throughout the globe, and they're giving those experiences to graduate and undergraduate students. And then finally, we need to en engage graduate education and graduate students in the process of extending this civic learning. If we're going to recenter it in terms of what we do and how we do it, I think graduate education and graduate students are central to that. So now I'll turn it over to uh to my the moderator who's going to pose some questions and i'm open to any questions from the audience as well thank you so much so as it's uh as it times out i'm just going to ask a couple of uh, follow-on questions from this uh stimulating introduction thank you dr otado and then we'll take uh, your questions from the q a but i want to pick up on that last provocative provocative point here you have laid out some really great uh stimuli for us, especially in that last slide. So how does, how does this land in graduate training? What's the role of civic learning in graduate training? 10% uh, of our respondents said they got that. Uh, right. That doesn't mean that's a you know completely scientific sampling, but you know that's a really interesting stat right there. But the question was about courses. It wasn't really thinking more broadly about civic okay. learning. So that's why I think it's a wonderful question because we are talking about going beyond just the basics in courses. We're talking about a whole range of things. So I think Dean Wentz did a wonderful job of really situating that, but graduate students play a critical role in the education of undergraduates and in the research enterprise of the university. They are really essential. They're academic citizens. They're also members of broader communities. Um, they will also be experts and promising leaders in their fields. So we have to think of that. I mean, we've always articulated this about undergraduates, but we're not really forceful enough about saying that graduate students are closer to making change and being leaders and experts in their field that's going to be so necessary in society. So let me say, for example, in training graduate students to teach or in their teaching roles, 
Um, they clearly have an influence on undergraduate student development uh, and how to become disciplined thinkers, but also to create democratic, democratic processes in the classroom or online um, to help engagement. So we really have to think about them as collaborators in this um, notion of really producing disciplined thinkers, different ways we can do this. And I think graduate students have good ideas and we have to be open to that as faculty leading and instructing to, to that. So the research roles, I wanna say something about that, obviously. Um, and then there's also the practice roles because there's you know professional students, et cetera, and we have to really think about those. But the research roles there and practice roles, there are any qualities that pervade many problems in research from economic to environmental to health disparities, um, including many social issues. But instead of ignoring them, I think we need to incorporate them in our studies uh, and not just social science. It is really thinking about how our studies are affected and the relationship even between the researcher and the participants in our studies. And I think that's that's a, a, an interesting way to think about it is that uh, is it really is a little bit of a paradigm shift when we think about uh, some of those things. So there are many projects that rely on communities for collaboration to complete research. Uh, but we also have to think about ways, and I think there are some that are, uh, some research that's really more action oriented to empower those communities as well to be involved in that process. And certainly, again, it, it depends on what paradigm you're following, obviously, but it's still very important to think about the ultimate goal of all this research is to advance social progress. And so graduate students have a critical role in that, not only what the research they're doing now, today, but the research they'll do in the future. Um, graduate programs and divisions, I think, can do more to help students prepare uh, to not only teach and do research, though that's very important, uh, is to really think about what they need at this developmental stage in their careers um, and their future roles and their disciplines. So in other words, we don't take someone who enters graduate school and expect them to be the same at the end of the process. That would be a real disservice if we expect them to be exactly the same person they started. Um, so. Uh, so we need to help them to aspire to influence their fields, uh, to be leaders, and understand the main issues in their field that hold promise for advancing the social progress that I talked about. So it's it's almost sort of, I maybe we articulate this, but I don't think we articulate it enough in terms of how influential they're going to be for the next generation of learners and for the next generation of inventions and the next generation of whatever we uh, aspire our society to become. So it's absolutely essential. And I pick up on that then um, because there are faculty in our audience today and we know that for all graduate students having good mentorship is key to having a successful experience along the way. Um, not, and not only along the way, but into that first position afterwards and onward. I mean, I'm still in touch with uh, many of my first graduates. And um, I'm interested in your work on um, both mentorship and the culturally aware aspects of mentoring. Can you tell us more about what that looks like and where faculty members in the audience can learn more about that? That's a great question. I feel like I'm being primed here because um, uh, having worked and having major uh, NIH grants the last few years, and this has been an explosion, I think, that I think is so wonderful to see more work on mentorship. There was a recent National Academy of Science report on effective mentorship in STEM and building on all the research. It's a wonderful resource. Just go to the National Academies Press and you can see effective mentorship. That's all the scholarship on mentorship and how it's played out at the undergraduate and graduate level. Um, and it's a great resource. There's also online resources for it. But I wanna say that 
the National Institutes of Health invested in a huge way uh, about five years ago with the development of the National Research Mentoring Network. And that work network was to pull together exactly that, build networks of mentors and mentees across uh, it, within fields. Most of this was done in the STEM area, but there's a lot uh, to be learned for that. So the first place might one might go is a National Research Mentoring Network, and they have a great website. Now, they started initially with, um, I would say, training and uh, videos and informative sources to be like a clearinghouse. Please unlock your device first. They've, they've now trans transitioned to, um, to becoming a major research enterprise. So now they're overseeing uh, several major research uh, programs and ours is one of them on the culture that we're mentoring in, in the biomedical fields. So they are really investing in mentorship as a key way to both diversify, expand, and improve the scientific training that we're getting. And to see this done uh, in science is really important. That means that I'm not saying that it's not important in the social science. I'm saying we've always sort of articulated these things, but the fact there's been a federal investment in this and a real a desire to see this as a key pathway um, that's not available only to the few, but to many more. And I think that's really key. So um, the other uh, place to go, if you want to go training, you want to get advice, uh, and all of that is the Center for the Improvement of Mentored Experiences in Research. That's CIMER, C-I-M-E-R, and that's at the University of Wisconsin. So it's it's basically a lot of the same people behind it, except these individuals will prepare our training people to be master uh, tra trainee, tra trainers in mentoring. And so culturally aware mentoring is a little bit distinct in uh, just general mentoring that there's also lots of online venues now, there's individuals can help um, in the Zoom environment in this. So there's actually more resources than there have ever been in terms of getting advanced mentoring. And our project, uh, which is a five-year project on culturally aware mentoring is working with faculty at Research One institutions who are mentoring graduate students. So we're very focused on the graduate student uh, advancement in that area. And the cultural aware mentoring is built on advancing understanding of identities and mentoring in, in the mentoring relationship and in labs and how opportunities get offered, who gets opportunities that offered to kind of raise that awareness. Um, and the way I like to say is that um, graduate students don't remove their identities when they come into a research relationship or even to a lab, like they remove a lab coat when they leave the lab, for example. Um, they, we are always kind of uh, wearing our identities, though they may be backgrounded, but a lot of activity, a lot of issues, a lot of events, even informal, in informal conversations, uh, activities, uh, identities can get uh, activated that more, become more salient. That I'm aware I'm a woman when I hear a remark that I think is sexist, right, made by uh, my advisor, right? So those are the things that we want to bring just some awareness about. Um, we don't expect everyone to get it right. This is not about getting it right. This is just about being more aware so that the processes are fairer and also more people feel included instead of excluded. That oh, I right. think. Oh, I was just saying, and by the way, it is a research study. <laughs> so okay. we do have people that are going into different kinds of training and we're studying it long term in terms of what happens when they go back to their graduate programs and are interacting with their peers and also with graduate students. So it's sort of a long term. It's a five year project. Thank you. I think if we if you can maybe send us some of those resources, we yes. can put them in our follow ons. Uh, I'm just going to ask one more question because I see some really good ones coming up in the Q and A's okay. and your, your comment about what if my advisor says something sexist uh, makes me pick this one of my, my list to ask to end on. And this is about when the inevitable arises and that's like a, a conflict. 
So if we mm -hmm. could talk about that for just a second. You've written that we need to start expecting conflict rather than avoiding it. And you've cited Parker, Palm, Parker Palmer's Five Habits of the Heart, one of which is, and I'm gonna quote it because I think it's just so beautiful, the ability to hold tension or conflict in life-giving ways. Can you spend a minute translating that into classroom praxis or working in the community or working maybe inside a committee or something that uh, applies to this graduate context for us? And then we're gonna turn it over to your Q and A's. Yeah, I think this is the biggest uh, transition or paradigm that I encountered as a teaching faculty uh, because I was exposed to um, several colleagues that had been engaged in intergroup dialogue and you know their opinion was amazing and of course Parker Palmer says it beautifully and it's it makes it so positive that you think oh I want to be involved in that <laughs> instead of instead of avoiding it um but uh but my colleagues said oh conflict's an opportunity to learn we don't know a, a lot of times in the classroom that we are thinking differently about these issues only the most vocal get their voice heard, and then we have to create a space so that we hear more. So I have had to approach my teaching in that way to think, oh, a conflict is an opportunity to learn. So let's wait till the conflict. So I even have students that are evaluating me at the end of the course, and they're saying, oh, we didn't have enough conflict. <laughs> Does that mean they weren't learning enough, right? Because they also began to see this as expect it, not avoid it. In other words, we are all socialized differently. We come from different backgrounds. We're now in a higher education space. Now we're on Zoom, it's even somewhat more difficult or we can see our backgrounds that we would not have seen, right? It, they, they're carried with us when we have our Zoom background sometimes. I see family in the background. I see pets, I see, I see more about a student than I have ever known now, right? So when you talk about issues, you're likely to have different perspectives, different views. They're, they're on the television every night, for example. So obviously we're going to have this opportunity. So the issue is then thinking about if you're going to expect conflict, then you prepare, you always prepare for it. And so that's, I think, a key thing for anyone, whether you're working in a, a relationship or you have, it's a classroom environment or it's another, it's a work environment. And so there are some activities that you can do that we do and we train when we think about this um, is that uh, one is employing active listening to make sure that you institute that from the very beginning. And the issue is, when we do these exercises, we find most of the time we're not listening. We're just preparing what we're going to say next or how we're going to argue or debate. And part of the active listening is to be able to repeat what the other person said and ask a question. Asking questions are great ways to clarify misunderstandings, misinformation, or understanding assumptions, uh, even thinking about uh, the causal links that people are making in their mind can be mined by asking a question. We have got to get better at asking questions, right? And I think any, most conflicts can be resolved through asking some good questions because there's, that's when the misunderstanding gets sorted out, can get sorted out. Now, I'm not saying that any of these things will re result in everyone agreeing. That's not the point. Of, of this, it really is to better understand one's positions and also um, to understand what, where the areas are where the interests are similar. We may be taking a, you know, putting our, uh, our heels in, right, on a particular stance, but we may really want the same thing in the end. So how do we, we won't do that until we have a dialogue or conversation and understand our, uh, our differences, but also where our interests are similar. And in those who have done uh, conflict mediation, that's certainly a, a major point in what you do. So there are ways of handling conflict that become less, uh, less I mean, well, let's just say, 
by avoiding it, you miss the opportunity uh, to learn more and to work through the process. So I get to the point where with working with my students, they trust the process, though they don't know what the solution is going to be at the end of our conversation or discussion of the issue. And that's okay. And to me, that's a lot like democracy in the classroom. You trust the process. You have a good, you have to have a good process in place, right? And then you can work through um, issues. So I think I think that's probably the most I'm going to say about it is that can we uh, we're not trained in as scholars or even in graduate school to handle conflict well. We are conflict avoiders, and we may have grown up that way because that's how we survived in some of our family situations. But to really rethink that has been a major transition in my work. Um, it's not easy because you want to be the authoritative person, but but stepping back and allow and empowering others to also facilitate that conversation is just very, I mean, I've learned so much from students, undergrad and graduate students who have come up with some amazing solutions, ideas, perspectives, and this is what higher education is all about, learning, so. Well, thank you so, so much. I want to call attention to the Q&A. Um, and I, I think may, maybe what I want to pick up as a follow on to this is the question that has the differentiation between civic, civics and civic engagement and, and really kind of focus in on this, the theme of the talk and the relationship between civic learning and preparing for a diverse democracy and how, how the, the two are actually really related. So if we could talk more about that. Sure. Um, I think in the civic learning um, elements that I talked about, it, it is recognizing people's backgrounds, their development, identities. It's, it's important to recognize that. So I think that um, when we think about a diverse democracy, wow, it's here. It, it, it's, you know, our schools are extremely diverse, our workplaces are extremely diverse, not all of our workplaces are extremely diverse, obviously, but I think it's here. And so how are we, how are we leveraging that, uh, that new era we're in uh, to advantage to, to the assets to achieve the goals that Dean Wentz talked about as an institution. And I think one is certainly an inclusion is having people at the table and represented but also providing ways to to give voice to the different perspectives and i think uh so long we thought democracy thrived when it was homogeneous but i think now we think democracy thrives when you have many different issues and areas and people and diversity of backgrounds that's the thriving part we have to realize further. We're working on it. It's a long-term project. Um, so for me, civic learning must always think about ways in which we are inclusive and ways in which we are thinking about race and gender and class and all those issues that are so pertinent and divide us or are used to divide us. Um, but also ways that we can think about how do we work on this. We're all in this together. If we have to think about it, we're all in this together, we have to make this work. Uh, let's try. Um, sticking in the American context for now, but we want to internationalize it eventually. How do we ensure equity in civic education among high and low income districts to not further widen the disparity in opportunities? Second question, civic education is not in state or federal prioritization, which is creating a generational indifference in the democratic process, importance of voting. How do we influence getting it added to academic curricula with emphasis? Oh, those are like three questions. <laughs> it's kind of stacked there, but we had a couple thumbs up on that one, so I thought I'd pass it along. Okay, so let me let me answer your last question. Can you just re repeat the last question? Because I think that marries all of that. So there's a generational indifference in the democratic process. The importance in vo of voting. How do we influence getting it added to academic curriculum with emphasis? Yeah. 
that's so important. And I think we are having conversations, though perhaps not in very civil ways, that you know, your your vote counts. And uh, yes, the youth have been less engaged in voting, um, but, but we have seen a bit of a change um, in the 2018 elections, uh, the midterm elections, we really did see a lot of engagement and many campuses were engaged in that process as well to get their students to vote. Not, not you know, how, not how to vote exactly, but to vote, uh, in other words, to express their voice. So I think that's part of it is we have to, some youth have preferred to, uh, for example, to show their civic engagement by doing service, not voting. For some reason, the distinction is there, right? We've seen that in some national surveys as well. So we have to really see that there are forms, different forms of participation that are going to be key. And certainly when we have an election year, like what you have in coming weeks, obviously, where lots of issues, not just the presidential election, but lots of issues are in the ballot that affect our communities, that affect our state. So um, this is really important for people to have a voice. And so I think institutions are doing more. There was that initiative called All In, where campuses were kind of competing with how can we get as many of our students as possible to vote, and what is the proportion on campus that are uh, that are uh, enrolled in campus that are voting um, is really important. I think we can do that more. Um, I think that uh, having public forums is really important, um, and and I think uh, encouraging people to get engaged in that, encouraging students to develop those forums, I think is really important. I think I think we have a moment where participation can really leap incredibly, uh, not because of well, let's see. A lot of different factors are playing into this, um, but I think we have a real moment to say, let's capture this moment of participation, broaden it, and really make it work. So it is quite a bit, it, it is a lot, but I think the, the questions really hit upon the whole issue where the youth of particular ages are less likely to vote. Um, those that are older typically vote, uh, religiously vote. So. How do we instill more of that in the in the youth? The world is theirs. We're going to have to depend on them. So we have to elevate their participation in every way because in the future we can't have people uh, giving up on the system, though, giving up on our democ democratic practices. I mean, you can oppose a system, no question. You can oppose it, but you have to really think about what. What kind of a democracy you aspire to be, and we want to remain participatory and inclusive. You're muted. Okay. We have a question about um, the quality of the discourse, and if um, you know, we want to. Um, how do you engage, how do you balance engaging students in civil discourse without driving them deeper into problematic ideologies? You started with an MLA quote, and with that in mind, he also said, there's nothing more tragic than sleep to sleep through a revolution. How do we effectively wake students up to the gravity of our current situation? The next uh, down on my uh, list is using strategies for implementing humility in civil civic discourse and learning? If so, have you found any to be most effective? I know you spoke earlier about uh, cultivating empathy, so I didn't know if those two might be related. And I have to check on a comment that came to me through another channel while you're answering. So I, okay. will. So I think that, um, uh, thank you for extending the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, is that all participation, I think, is not the same, obviously. And we have to really think, I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for really pushing for advancing social progress, whether that be scientific or whether that be social. Uh, but how do we, in other words, if we are going down the wrong path where we are seeing incredible division, it's not gonna help us, uh, for example, economic, inequalities. For us to be high in the world and economic inequality, 
really just portends a um, disaster for our democracy. So we have to care enough about uh, ourselves and our world uh, and our democracy to be able to, uh, I would say, put it back on track towards where we aspire to be. Now, we all may have differences, and there are differences, obviously. But in some ways, I like to say that maybe they all average out and then we, we come unsettled on something that we can live with. But I don't know. I mean, that's, that's just a theoretical notion of when you have people far left and far right, that you know, you kind of it, average it out and some, some people are happy, some people are not as happy, et cetera, right? So, but I think that um, driving people deeper, let me use a little bit of an example uh really quickly because i know we're running out of time is that for example um the white house has a, is issued an executive order that really uh downplays uh systemic racism and um and also says that we shouldn't teach or train about racism if it makes people uncomfortable well any chat any discussion about racism is going to make people uncomfortable on any 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 from any background is going to be because we we're not comfortable doing that we're not comfortable doing that so but the issue that we uh began to settle on was like what are the values and you know certainly people talk about first amendment rights but those are applicable mostly to government action and public institutions, although in California, we have um, a, a state law that extends it to private institutions. But it's really this notion of academic freedom. Our universities are special places. We are not like other um, countries where the government controls and in fact appoints the president. As soon as an election happens, a new president is appointed and provost is appointed. We have a history of being uh, what Amy, Amy Gutman calls sanctuaries of non-repression, where both uh, ideas that are unpopular and ideas that are popular can be shared, advanced, research that is basic, that people have no clue has a uh, relationship to what's needed today can occur. Uh, and it may be so forward thinking that it will help us in the future. This has happened in the past with some great advances in, in health um, is people were doing some basic research. So we have to think of our institutions as places where we can ask any question and find answers, right? This is a special place for us, right? This may not be clear in all employment areas, but I believe that we need to um, ask any question and answer it in post-secondary institutions, particularly public universities, and answer responsibly according to the standards set by our disciplines. This is very important for graduate students. There are standards in your disciplines for determining good research, for determining how you evaluate an argument, for critiquing an argument, we have to have those safeguards in place. And that's what our institutions are about, as safeguarding an area of American society, we can always ask questions, even if they're unpopular, and have and research them and teach them. Um, it's the freedom to learn and the freedom to teach, but it's also the freedom to do research. So I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. That's a uh... That's so inspiring. And I and I want to, even though that might be a nice point to end on, I still think we need to acknowledge another hugely important population of our great public institution, and that is our international student population. Okay. Yes. So, and I'm going to read this from uh, Nick, contributed this this. Uh, question that got quite a number of thumbs up. I can't help but think of civic learning through an American lens 
If a professor leads students to think of voting or jury duty, that can be great for American students, but wouldn't it be far less useful for Indian or Chinese foreign students? How can we lead groups through civic learning exercises in a way that is inclusive and valuable to international students? Because what you were just saying could send a global message from our great academically free role models throughout the world. So. That really is a great question because I've had international students in my courses and they immediately recognize how American higher education is different from their own training and different. And they also recognize in the classroom, our expectations are that people will uh, question, that people will be critical. And I did have a student from China where a student sort of uh, spoke and said, well, I'm kind of tired of being the critic. I always say, you know, people are all seem to be agreeing with each other and I bring up a point. And so it's always been difficult, she said, to play that role in class. And I and he said, that role is so important. In other words, even though that was not part of his education, he said, I appreciate hearing and knowing that you have you feel empowered enough to critique what everyone else is saying. And I get to see the reaction. I get to see how this plays out. So in a way, it's it's like we're living the democracy in our classrooms and others uh, from international worlds are learning. That doesn't mean we impose those values on that. Those are different cultures. Those are different political systems. They have different his histories. as. Most of them are much older than the United States in terms of their history. And uh, we can't be myopic in that way either because we think we're so great. Well, we've got a lot to work on. As open as we are, we've got a lot to work on. But I think international perspectives are so important in our education because they help us see us. They help us to be less myopic. Well, I want to thank you so much for sharing your, your insights, your wisdom, this new phase of your research with us. And um, I wish you all the best in, in your future um, journey on this particular topic. And we want to definitely stay tuned on that. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you. It was a real honor. And I, it was great to learn more about Arizona State University. So thank you. I thank hope you that so you much can for coming. Come back. Everybody's clapping now. <laughs> yes. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Hurtado, for being our featured speaker this year. Please accept this virtual round of applause from all of us. Um, additionally, uh, the Graduate College would like to thank Dean Wentz and uh, Dean Underreiner for participating in today's event. And thank you as the participants, um, especially those who submitted questions. Uh, we apologize if you couldn't get to all of it today, but we do appreciate your active participation um, in this very important dialogue. Um, a recording of today's event will be made available um, in the coming days as well. Um, and we'll also send out some additional resources and writings uh, by Dr. Hurtado. Uh, so be on the lookout for that via email and social media. Um, on behalf of the entire staff of the ASU Graduate College, thank you for tuning in to view the 2020 Distinguished Lecture, and we look forward to hosting you again soon. Have a great day.